Hello. You hear us? Yes, we can see you. We can hear you. Uh, your screen share is no longer up, but maybe you stop sharing. I stopped sharing. Yep. Great. Well, I think we're. Uh, I think you can take it away. Great. Well, uh, my name is Paul. I'm a mechanical engineer here at CMS. Um, this is uh, Andres. Hey. Yeah, so I'm a particle physicist working with CMS, and we have Sonia. Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a, an astroparticle physicist, and I will be your guide, uh, underground guide today uh, to show you how wonderful is this experiment. Sorry, I was distracted because I'm the same high as you. <laughs> the, funny, the funny part of this story. <laughs> so yeah, me and Andres will be staying up in the control room here uh, just to give you some extra information about CMS. And uh, just while uh, Sonia is not able to, as uh, sometimes the connection cuts out at certain points underground. Yeah, so we'll be taking you guys underground. Um, unfortunately, we are not going to be able to show you the detector. We have beams uh, circulating in the LHC at the moment but uh, we'll get to show you the underground areas. Will be, it will be super exciting. Yes, fortunately for data in any case. Yeah. And uh, okay, you will see, I will try not uh, to leave you without uh, special uh, features. So we will experience in any case, the magnetic field of CMS, which is quite interesting and uh, surprising because we are far from the, from the detector in a far, but the magnetic field uh, is still there. <laughs> You will see. Yeah, it's extremely strong. Uh, it's the most powerful solenoid um, in the world at the moment, uh, 3.8 Tesla uh, at its full magnetic uh, magnitude. Uh, there's another one being built just now. I was having a look today uh, for the ITER project, uh, nuclear fusion, which is a lot bigger than that. But right now, we have the most powerful solenoid magnet in the world. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we get started? Um... Yes, we get started. So I leave uh, the floor to my colleagues, I prepare to go underground. We will see in a few minutes uh, in another configuration. Bye. Sounds good. See you. Great. So um, yeah, I think for us, we can get started by uh, first pointing out that we are in a new space. So we are in the brand new CMS control room. Oh, and so, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, usually so, yeah. the old control room was uh, blue. Uh, it looked like you were straight out the 1990s, but here we look like we're in the future. This is uh, quite a beautiful control room, in my opinion. Yeah. So we just. Um, I think Sonia and I can show around. In yes, the, maybe they, they can show the control room. Yeah. But we just moved in um, maybe a week ago. So that's when we first had, yeah, had the first shift. Yeah. Feel the smell. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's really really brand new. So I this might be the first virtual visit from no no no, no okay, this we is the fourth happy. one we we okay, had a big so week. quite a few, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, we'll show you guys a bit of the control room. The uh, CMS is of course changing all the time, but one of the things that I will like to briefly talk about in a bit is perhaps the high luminosity upgrade. So that's one of the things that we can touch upon, and uh, we'll also talk to you guys a little bit more about the LHC itself, especially that help, I think would help um, to sort of give you some context of what the high luminosity LHC project will be. And maybe we can start with a quick um, overview of the LHC and then- uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Sonia's uh, camera, yeah. Okay. Yes. Actually, maybe we could do a tour first yeah. of the okay. control room. Look, I, I just approach people here so maybe we can also try to ask uh, hello no problem no problem no problem we, we <laughs> sorry i didn't want to disturb you okay we have here a shifter as you see uh for example okay you can uh, i don't know if you can come closer here we still have uh, we have uh, the condition of the beam we, so you still uh, not see uh, information about uh, the beam here, but this is uh, the display we get when uh, we want to check uh, the the beam. I don't know. Maybe our shifter wants to say something uh, about this more special. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, but in general. Uh, so currently we don't have a beam, so we we, we say the beam. Of the yeah. Space. So we could also get some information here, like uh, it is our standard. So uh, 
sometimes we do some tasks. So we'll Sonia, I'm afraid we don't hear very well the shifter as, as she, ah. she is not in the, the microphone's range. So if you ah, can yes, look okay, around sorry. in a global, how the, the, sorry, the control sorry, room sorry. looks like. I, I thought that it was enough. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, hello. So if if you could no. say okay. Sorry, I wanted to do something special. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to do something special, but it seems that okay, the system is not following me. So let's do quickly. Also, because we have to spend our time underground. So we can uh, continue. Do you want to uh, give any comment uh, about uh, the rest of the of the room? Otherwise, uh, I go very fastly. Yeah. Yes, we can, of course. That, yeah. Uh, what is seen now is uh, besides that I am there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just did the floor. So it's around. So this this is a quiet place. What uh, the camera looks now at. Uh, um, these are spare monitors, and of course the 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 event displays but of course at this moment we don't have anything it is uh, that would be very interesting uh on the right from from us there is uh, the so-called brill the well well andres you are from brill yes. you can talk about of course yes, yes. Yeah. so this station is uh yeah what i work on is is uh responsible for these measurements so we look at what we call luminosity, which is roughly speaking the rate of interactions at the LHC. So at the moment, we don't have any collisions that are happening, but uh, in the past few days, we've had the first circulating beams in the machine, and we have many systems that are monitoring different aspects of the LHC. So for instance, we're looking at what we call the beam backgrounds. We're also looking at the uh, basically the position of the beams and the machine, the, the filled bunches, as we say. And there's quite a lot of monitoring that uh, has to happen from our side in in part to ensure the safe operation of the LHC and of the CMS detector. So there's a very, very short outline of what you're looking at. Uh, I'm happy to go into details if people are curious, but that's just the... A... Andres, I like this in this monitor. Yes, so we have these communication heartbeats, and these are animated, and it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just for fun, it's actually letting us know that communication is happening and it's ongoing. If these were not animated, that would not be great news. I think it was, uh, uh, historically, it was invented by the tracker, and many other subsystems, including our own with Miami, we've stolen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. okay, I move on the other side. Yes, so uh, if you, Andres, if you want to continue, and I, I will uh, come back again um, the, uh, later, okay? Sounds good. So, yeah, I think we could show you a photo of uh, where the LHC actually is and the detectors that, uh, that are around us that detect the particles. So uh, this photo here, um, once it gets enlarged a bit more, uh, you, yeah, here you go. This is the Large Hadron Collider, our particle accelerator, and uh, you could see the four general, well, four different detectors that surround it. We have uh, CMS on the very left side. Uh, that's where we are right now. We have ALICE, uh, ATLAS, and LHCB. And uh, CMS and ATLAS, there are two general purpose detectors. Now, uh, they are used to detect the same things, uh, but they were just built in a, in a different way. Um, and we need both of these to confirm that the science that we're seeing from collisions is, uh, is in fact, true and that we could prove it using two different detectors. Alice uh, is used uh, for heavy ion collisions, lead ion collisions, um, just for more uh, for more physics understanding. And uh, LHCB is, uh, is another one of our detectors. Uh, remind me, please, uh, what is LHCB for again? So LHCB looks at more specialized physics, uh, what they call flavor physics, but they study um, different aspects of uh, symmetry. Um, so they'll look at something we call B physics. So that's the related to the B quark. Um, depending on who you ask, the B quark stands for bottom quark. Uh, in LHCB in particular, I found that people uh, refer to it as the beauty quark. Uh, 
So there's the top and bottom quarks. Some uh, people refer to them as, as truth and beauty. But they, in any case, they, they study more specialized physics uh, involving, in particular, the B quarks. Great. So that, that was good. Uh, thanks for that explanation. I wasn't completely sure about how it works. But um, oh, I think Sonia is about to go underground now. So we'll go over to her. and. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Sorry if I will uh, speak maybe loud, but here it's very noisy. I saw, uh, I know that you cannot uh, hear this noise, but here is very noisy. I will try to speak normally, but I don't know if I will succeed. So in fact, I'm uh, ready to enter the experimental uh, area. And in order to enter, we had to, to check to budge through to go through this door. Uh, this door is uh, for people. We have also another special door that I will show you later, which is for material. And uh, basically, there are three checks that we are uh, uh, we have to pass. One uh, is uh, maybe Noemi, which is, she is with me. She can help me to understand to show. There is this. Uh, you see this uh, square with these uh, yellow dots here, and this is a sort of scale. Uh, is there to verify that the, per, uh, the, the what you is entering is, uh, let's say, in the size of a person, the weight of a person. And then uh, we cannot enter transporting material, which means, for example, I cannot enter having a backpack. In fact, there are infrared beams uh, that are checking that I don't have anything with me. And then uh, there is uh, the last thing, uh, which is uh, really personal, is uh, to check the my ID. And to do this, uh, uh, there is uh, the, this mechanism, which is for the iris uh, check. So I will enter using my personal dosimeter uh, and then doing the check, you will see. So let's go. The door should open. And then I enter, I step inside. As the door closes, I make myself recognizing the system I take a picture and that's it i mean and now i wait for uh, uh noemi she's helping me for the camera she's doing the same she's very good because she's introducing also something inside so she has a how to say hide this object to her from the system and she succeeded so she will show you the iris check through the camera and then that's it. And then we are inside the experimental area, less noisy than before. And here we have also another group in visits. So maybe we can profit to show how the material, the door of the material, you see, we have our visitors that are entering. Ah, we are unlucky. Okay, we are unlucky because uh, somebody from underground called the, the elevator. Uh, Andres, I think I will give you the, the, the floor because here is noisy because of the other visitors. Is it okay? Yeah, no yeah, problem. It's fine. Okay, uh, yes. We'll, uh, we'll continue from now while we wait for the elevator. Uh, we've got a nice photo here to show, uh, to show the underground and... Uh, how we actually get our things underground as well. So um, we'll show you this. When it comes up, we'll uh, start to explain. Yeah. There we go. Now, I uh, hope you can see this clearly. This is all of the points you've seen on the circular, uh, circular photograph before. And this is all of our detectors that uh, we showed you. And it shows you all of the underground, the LHC from the underground as well. Now, um, to get all of our things underground, all of the detector parts, it is a very uh, slow and difficult process. And here at CMS, we actually have a great massive, uh, what would you call it? Like a big hole, you could say. Uh, and we could remove the, we have a, a floor that opens up, a massive concrete floor. And uh, CMS was built above the ground and assembled below the ground. So each, each piece of CMS um, was, lowered and then assembled underground now it is extremely heavy cms is the heaviest of our detectors here at cern 
weighing in at 14,000 tons, which is, uh, yeah, it's quite heavy. Yeah. It's, you can think of it as as heavy as 14,000 small cars. Yeah, which is uh, unbelievable. Uh, so CMS is kind of like an onion, uh, it has layers, and uh, all of these layers uh, detect different particles uh, from the inside out, um, which we will get into further soon. Uh, sorry, can I say just the one word? Yeah, I'm in the elevator. Yes, because now we lose the communication. So I'm in the elevator. Please look. Oh, I think we just lost <laughs> yeah, that. We just lost her. Okay. Uh, so um, the, the elevators are pressurized. Uh, they are actually some of the only elevators in the world you're recommended to use in the case of an emergency. And uh, yeah, that's how we lose all sort of communication and signal uh, from Sonia. It's while not she because it's pressurized. It's because it's metallic. Uh, because it's metallic, not because it's pressurized, but it is also pressurized. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Sonia is now on her way, um, nearly a hundred meters underground. So the floor of our detector is ninety-seven meters underground. Uh, Sonia is heading to uh, the minus two level, which is eighty-seven meters underground. And uh, I just wanted to show you here. Address? We were... Yes, Sonia. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. 87.9 yes no sorry because as we have a group uh, so i want to just to tell you that uh, differently from the other times that uh, we go straight forward uh, to the magnetic field and then coming back i will describe all the things okay okay no, if we don't lose her <laughs> okay Okay, so I just very quickly wanted to show you this picture of cms here that clearly shows you uh Two things, right? So um, we were just saying that CMS is a bit like an onion. It's a, it's actually like a cylindrical onion. It has layers inside of layers inside of layers, and then we actually slice though that cylindrical onion into layers or slices, and that's how CMS is configured. There's about a dozen slices, and these uh, slices were individually lowered lowered down a uh, hundred meters or so, uh, and that's what we have downstairs. Is all these layers. Um, assembled together in a very compact configuration. So that's what the CMS stands for. It's a C, uh, CMS is for, stands for compact muon solenoid. Uh, we can talk about a few of these things, but maybe we can uh, quickly show you where Sonia is and where she's headed. So this is a view from above showing you the underground areas. And Sonia just took the elevator here shown as PM54, and she's now making her way in this direction down this corridor and she has already arrived she has probably already arrived so we have a lot yes, of electronics i already room. arrived and she <laughs> is uh, in this corner here where she will show us actually she's in this corner but she uh, i'll let you take over sonia yes okay thank you very much so you see uh, i'm uh, close to this uh, <laughs> to this uh, guy uh, this is a special uh, um object uh, that is uh, basically is a safety mask that we you we could should use in case there is uh, an evacuation alarm or better there is a, a of course evacuation alarm is because uh, we have uh, uh, for example a gas leakage or there is smoke or whatever so we have this uh, safety tool that is inside this box as you see so we are trained, the old people working here is trained to be able to open this box and wear this thing in more or less, let's say, 30 seconds. And then, of course, uh, the, the statement is that keep calm and proceed to the exit. Now, one exit that I will go, I will use again because I was coming as uh, Noemi, she's showing uh, from uh, this path. We have two exits. One is the, the one I was already using. And the other one is uh, behind this door, as you see. This door brings, and maybe then uh, uh, from the surface, uh, you can show better. This door brings to the LHC tunnel, uh, but not only, there is also a second elevator. And uh, this second elevator is uh, exactly in case we cannot go back from the path I've used. Now, I think that the most interesting thing to show here because you see this corridor, this corridor is uh, connecting uh, this part, which is uh, on my left. So I'm here, you see? This part be on the, my back 
is the service cavern. And then uh, if I, no, I mean, it's following me, me perfectly. I have this corridor and then on the other side, in parallel to the, the cavern I've shown before, there is the experimental cavern where the detector is. Uh, but from here, I can approach the magnetic field. And uh, to show you something, uh, I have a detector with me, very expensive detector, I would say, but is a detector. I will show you. Okay, this is my detector. Uh, I don't know if you are smiling, laughing, or thinking that I'm joking. This is a detector. And so I, I will spend some time with this detector. As you see, it's not magnetized. It is a chain of paper clips, nothing else, but can be transformed in, the, in a detector. Uh, so let's go. The first thing that I can uh, do using this chain is uh, to feel, uh, to see, to detect the magnetic field if it's there. So I do not believe if people in the control room who told me that there is the magnetic field on, but I will believe this clips, uh, paper clips chain. Now, please pay attention to this one, the last one, and start to see something that happens. As you see, maybe here, it's better to see. You see, you see, you see, it's bending. Look, look, look. Well, here we are. You see the chain is bent and you see that I can, uh, we can do many things. Okay, we can start to play with this, uh, for example, like that. Okay. Okay, this is new. Just inventing in this moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then of course, you see, uh, now if uh, we go a little bit back, Noemi, uh, imagine that behind me, the, the, the wall is transparent. So you could imagine that from this point, about uh, at 30 meters, more or less, you have the end cap of the detector, and then the detector goes inside the cavern for other, let's say, 25 meters, more or less. So we still feel the fringe magnetic field in this point. And we can play a little bit, you see? So for example, another thing that we can do with this chain is that you see here, we have a, a, a metallic protection, but this is no magnetic uh, while the screws they are. And so one of the things that we can do is a, a pendulum, why not? Look, okay, we can uh, uh, make oscillation. If you remember the law, of the oscillation of a pendulum, you can calculate this. Uh, we can do another thing that I call, this is my personal uh, invention, is the magnetic swing, which is this one, you see? And now, believe me or not, but if I do this, uh, I, uh, I, I enter, as I say, in resonance, I feel on my fingers here that I'm pushing down the chain, but the chain is pushing me Back. So it's a sort of elastic uh, uh, force that I feel on my fingers here. And then uh, why I was talking about a detector exactly for this configuration, why? Because once I wanted to show this and it happened that each time I tried uh, to fix these uh, two clips on the wall on the screws, uh, it was falling down. Uh, the first time I thought that this was because of me, I was wrong, so I started again and it fell down again, three times in a row. So at a certain point I understood that the weight of the chain, the number of clips was too much for the magnetic field of feeling here. And so I removed some clips and I had the chain working. But what was funny is that after the, the visit, because it was in the visit, I went to the control room where uh, my colleagues are and I, I went to the chief leader asking if there was any issue about the magnetic field, because it's what, what I was feeling here was not exactly what, what we experience even now. And this person asked me, how do you know this? Why you know this? And I said, you know, I was measuring. Now, of course, I couldn't give him a number. 
but I had the feeling that the magnetic field was not the usual one. And in fact, it told me that there was a problem in the morning, this happened in the afternoon, and then they were using a half intensity magnetic field this day. So you see, when I was saying that this is a detector, it is. And imagine if I could associate one clip to the a dropping or an increasing of the magnetic field, what he, I call a, a calibration of this chain. I could really counting uh, the number of clips, know roughly how much is the magnetic field uh, any moment. So this is really a detector, not so precise, but surely not expensive, a uh, rough. And then I have another thing before I leave this place and I show you a little bit of the, the door is another thing that happened just again by chance. I was looking for my wonderful chain here. And you see, I had the many clips here. I thought that this was a chain too, but it was not. And in fact, they dropped on the floor and they started to do this. You can see. I hope that you can see this. Uh, clips here, not only here, here you have a, a metallic surface, but here you have a concrete that surely should contain some metallic stuff. And you see, can you see, you can see all these clips here. And then I have a, another one here, which is a little bit special, is a, a little bit bigger. So you can see what I can do. I'm not touching. This is not wind, of course. Eh? I'm not producing any wind because uh, I'm trying to stop this one. You see, if I'm doing with my hands, a hand, I'm doing some wind. I'm not moving the clips. But if I do with this, you see, I can even look this. I can make it os oscillating. This is because I'm using again the magnetization and I can feel uh, as I was touching. Uh, what is in between is as when you have these magnets uh, you uh, you you play when you are a, a kid so the last thing i will show you somebody suggested me to recover all the clips in that way i say very clever thing so i will recover all the clips in that way you see okay let's do and then uh, this person now i don't know if you can show from the top or oh, no emmy this is, you see, it's a circle. So this other person was on the other side. So asked me to play with the clips too. And when I did this, you see, all the, almost all the clips, they fell down. Why? Because basically from my position to this one, there is a drop in intensity. So the magnetic field is not constant. So you see, even with that, these other configuration of clips, I can, uh, I can uh, be sensitive to the magnetic field here. I can in such a way uh, me not measure in this case, but however, know that there is a difference between my position and just uh, uh, 70 centimeters on the other side. The last thing that I show you is uh, something that surely you know is on my mobile phone as this one that you can recognize. I think you can recognize. This is a compass. Of course, this compass is sensitive to the magnetic field of CMS. And uh, as this, uh, this is not a real magnet, it's just aligning with the lines of the magnetic field. So I can reverse 180 degrees, you see, it still stays. But if I want to put a 90 degrees position with respect to the magnetic field, sorry, this is not to be, you see? I cannot do. This is because uh, my clip is aligning, is showing me alive the alignment of the magnetic field. Okay, so uh, I think that I can, for the time being, I recover everything. Okay, maybe I can describe a little bit here, and then I will give the floor to continue, and I will take again uh, some uh, the the floor in the in the in another point here. So you see, if it was possible to enter the experimental cavern, I would have passed again 
I would have done the check again through this door that is uh, equivalent to the green I did. Uh, I used the uh, on surface as the same system. And then uh, after 10 meters, uh, there is the door of the of the experimental cavern. Now, Noemi, she's showing you the system, uh, more or less give you a glimpse of the situation. Uh, sometimes uh, it depends. The access, as you see, can be different. We have a closed, automatic, a restricted, patrol, general. General is the one that you can enter. Eh? Nobody is controlled. Sometimes uh, we have to budge again with the dosimeter to this. Uh, and to enter, we need a, what we call a token, which is, let's say, a, a key. You do not open anything with this key, but is a, is a token. It's called, yes. And so uh, this is uh, one token per person. Where I found this in these boxes. So I badge here, the box open, and I take one of these token and I enter there. Uh, and the, the system of LHC is totally blocked. It means that if the token doesn't come back, LHC cannot be switched on, okay? This is why I said one token, one person. If you have one token, two people, this doesn't work because if one people stays inside and the token goes back, it's a problem. Okay, this is a safety issue and there is a procedure, a, a protocol, uh, it's open uh, because uh, it's really something uh, that shouldn't happen. So uh, for the time being, I give the floor uh, to my colleagues. Uh, and I recover all my stuff here. And uh, we see in a few minutes, unless you have questions. Okay, so thank you, Sonia. So maybe there's something I can quickly show to give you some context uh, as to where Sonia was at the moment. Uh, and we, you already saw this map from overhead. So hopefully it's clear uh, how she got here, so uh, how, she, how Sonia got to where she is. So she took the elevator, walked down this corridor and then she is currently in this corner here. So something that uh, is not obvious from where she is standing is that the wall uh, just adjacent, just next to where Sonia was, is what in this picture is called the pilier. And this is a seven meter thick reinforced concrete wall that separates the, uh, the area where Sonia is from the area where the detector, the CMS detector is, which is over here. So that means that we can be underground and we can take visitors underground even when there is beam circulating around the LHC. Great, we'll go on to the next slide here. Uh, and this is a good, uh, a good photo to show you the, how the onion of CMS is uh, built up, all the different layers that it has. So uh, it has the silicon trackers uh, in the very beginning. It is built up so that the very outer layers, uh, they catch the, the particles that escape through the, the first detectors. Uh, so to start off, we have the silicon trackers. Uh, this, uh, this detects, that's just right in the middle there, yeah. This detects the, the particles that come out straight away. There's a good, uh, this is a, a good image to show. So you have the silicon tracker at the start. Um, and then uh, after that, you have the electromagnetic calorimeter, which uh, measures the electrons and uh, other uh, particles like this. Uh, after that, we have the hadron calorimeter, which uh, measures the protons and uh, other hadrons uh, uh, and measures the energy of them. Uh, this uses, uh, I think, uh, is it the scintillating crystals or for that's how we measure using the electromagnetic calorimeter? Yes. Yeah, so in the hadronic calorimeter, we have scintillator, but they're pl plastic scintillators. Ah, okay. Yeah. And we use a. Uh, we use metal as well. It's brass. It's, yes. Brass. Sorry, it's brass. So it, it, brass. It's, uh, exactly. Brass. It's what we call a, a sampling calorimeter. So it has scintillators and then it has layers of metal to absorb the uh, the part the energy of these particles. So then we have our uh, our superconducting solenoid. Uh, Sorry. Our, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. Just a comment on the brass. Maybe, okay, it's nice to say that this brass uh, the, the origin of this brass. This was uh, 
brass melted from uh, some guns, real guns, that was uh, used uh, again for uh, science. So I would say that this is uh, an important uh, recycling of uh, material, you see? And uh, we have uh, the chance to have uh, an hadron calorimeter, just uh, recycling uh, brass uh, used for uh, another uh, purpose, uh, less, let's say, ethical or moral. So I, th I think it was nice uh, to say this. Uh, um, yeah, thank you, then, Sonia. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe I can add just a bit more detail. So uh, yeah, so the hadronic calorimeter, in some sections, it uses brass and some of the brass a significant quantity, but not all of it. Some of the brass uh, comes from artillery shells. And uh, this brass actually predates the nuclear age. Yeah, so it also, yeah, yeah, it also means that the brass uh, has a very high purity in terms. Uh, so when you make any metals, you make brass, for example, there's oxygen that you use from the atmosphere and there are small trace amounts of uh, radioactivity. So this is also very, um, very pure brass in the sense of it's old enough that it predates the nuclear age. So it's a very low background radioactivity in that material. Yeah, yeah. so um, we have the magnet straight after that. Um, we use this, of course, to uh, bend the particles. So we know uh, which particles are which when, uh, when we're detecting. And uh, finally, on the outside, we have the steel yoke, which uh, almost contains to that extent the magnetic field uh, and makes it stronger within the detector uh, so we could uh, harness as much magnetic uh, magnitude as possible. Um, and we have the muon chambers uh, interlinked within the, these steel yokes. Muons could, uh, they could go through and escape all of the previous detectors and go through the superconducting solenoid. So this is why we put the detector, uh, the muon detectors on the outside. Um, as this is the last, uh, the last part. Where sorry, we them. go ahead. Sorry to disturb you, but as I have the the group coming, uh, just let me say a few things here so we can swap because otherwise I cannot talk. So uh, you see, I'm I'm not in uh, in the LHC tunnel. This, I'm just uh, cheating. Okay, mm -hmm. but this is a nice feature that visitors uh, they use. Uh, uh, to, to cheat a little bit. Basically, I'm in the same place as I was before uh, in front of this, but maybe it's interesting to say one other thing that, yes, we don't have uh, steel collisions, uh, but we can come here any day along the year. And this is strictly forbidden for other experiments. When uh, the, the, the collision starts, and I think already now the, the other experiments, they have closed the access to the, the uh, to underground access because it's a safety reason. Uh, as I was explaining before, uh, we have the second escape uh, path, which is in any case connected and dealing only with the service cavern, which is on my left. Uh, other experiments, they have uh, the second escape path on the other side of the experimental cavern. So this means that if you cannot go back from uh, your original path, in order to evacuate, you have to go through the experimental cavern. And for visitors, CERN decided that this is not uh, allowed. And this is why visitors, they are not uh, allowed to go underground during the data taking. CMS is really special. We can stay here even if there are collision on the experimental cavern. This is because we can always use one of the two. The two options are always valid in case of an evacuation. Uh, I go back now. I see you again in the country room, OK? All right, thank you, Sonia. OK, so uh, I think this would be a good time to see if there's any questions. So from uh, your side, if you have any questions at all, we have a Q&A in Zoom, and you are welcome to send us any questions that you might have. Well, also from the auditorium. If and yes, if there them. are questions live from the auditorium, please uh, feel free. Any questions? Hello? in the room? Andres? Here? Yes. We in the meanwhile, question. we wait for questions. Sir. 
Can I show you some cables and optical fibers? I think we have a question. Do you have questions? No. I can, they can um, hear me. Can you hear me? Look like in the Sorry. LAT. What does the what look like? What does an emergency look like in the LAT? Okay. Like okay. What, could okay. what are the risks? Okay, so there's a question about what does an emergency look like or what are the risks? Ah. <laughs> And okay. this is, there's many risks at the LHC. Yeah. Um, so there's also, maybe I should also say that safety is taken extremely seriously. And there's many, many, uh, there, there's a lot of monitoring. There's a lot of training that's involved in making sure that, uh, that all of the operations are safe. But yes. just to give you a hint of uh, all of the risks that are associated with running this type of experiment, so uh, one of the things that is um, sort of more evident, more obvious is radioactivity. So uh, we run a detector in an environment that's, uh, that can ra uh, generate radioactivity and parts of the detector can remain radioactive for a while. So th the first thing is monitoring, right? So we try to limit the exposure to radiation and we measure it very precisely. Uh, so that's one of the aspects. And, and then if there's any interventions, if we take in material in or out, we have to keep track of everything very precisely. And this is also regulated by law. So Sonia was just showing her personal dosimeter and we have to read it out every month. And there's, again, associated trainings with that. But there's yes, other- Yes, Andres. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Andres. So just to talk about radiation, maybe we can say that, however, uh, I, uh, we have our personal dosimeter. This is integrated dosimeter. So we read uh, every month. We have another one, which is uh, operational. We read, uh, uh, we can take, I don't have it now with me, but we can take and it reacts immediately if there is uh, any issue when I come here. But consider that usually uh, when, we, the, we, we, when we read out uh, this dosimeter, uh, the dose that is, uh, is read, uh, is not too much. In fact, we we change it. Uh, let's say uh, it's one per year. Uh, per year, and it's safe, um, which is not the case. If you take this uh, on a flight, uh, it happened that somebody just forgot this in his bag, and he was flying to US. And when he came back, he just was checking. Uh, and it was immediately called by the medical service because the amount of radiation detected by this dosimeter was huge with respect to the normal one, the usual one that you can have here. This is just to say that unless there is a, an incident, here is really safe. It's different for visitors. This is for workers. For visitors, we even don't want if you, if you wanted that, if there is an evacuation alarm, they are exposed to possible other radiation. This is why some detectors, uh, they uh, do not allow visitors to go underground. Here, I repeat, we are totally separated by the other, uh, the other, uh, the experimental cavern. Okay, Andres, you want to continue or uh, yeah. let Thanks. me know when I can show you some cables. I'm okay, here the... to wait for you. <laughs> yeah, just to wrap up the question. So just yes. again, to stress, as Sonia mentioned, there's no way to physically get into the detector while the beam is circulating or collisions are happening. The, the LHC will interlock and it will be blocked be long before you can get there. I would just like to add, sorry, just another couple of things. So CMS is, uh, because we have a lot of people visiting CMS, uh, it's quite safe. Uh, however, in the LHC, the actual tunnel, a lot more safety measures uh, have to take place. Uh, people have to have their uh, operational dosimeters with them at all times. They have to have a self-rescue mask, which uh, Sonia showed before on the on the mannequin that she was hugging. And uh, this is in case, so a helium leak could occur. Um, all of the LHC is uh, cooled by uh, magnets, dipole. Uh, it's cooled uh, down by liquid helium uh, to cool the magnets. Um, to a very cold temperature. And uh, if a helium leak occurs, uh, this could displace the oxygen in the LHC, um, providing a need, uh, an oxygen, oxygen deficiency hazard, providing a need for uh, a mask to keep you safe. 
because in the worst case scenario, you have to walk for uh, about four kilometers to actually get uh, out of the LHC um, in the worst case. So that's another issue uh, of safety and evacuation and emergency. Yeah. But so we should quite... say that we are trained no? to do this. Oh, yeah, we have so... to do this. Uh, yes, okay. We do simulations uh, that, okay, uh, they are very realistic, I would say. They are done by the fire brigades. So we have to pass this test every, let's say, depends, one year, two years, it depends. But we have to pass this. So we are trained to do this. Yeah, uh, we get trainings for uh, all of the all of these things uh, as like it was said before, safety is taken very seriously here, so. Okay, so I think we have uh, a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, so. Yes, uh, Andres, before you answer the question, I show quickly the cables here, the county room, then I come up, okay? Is it okay with you? Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay, yes, okay, I wanted to show two things. This is my preferred wall, okay? I don't know if uh, I can open. So Noemi, she can show you this. Uh, this is for me the perfect wall for the cabling because you know, in my, I think that all uh, my colleagues said uh, they did uh, some cabling. They know exactly how much time it takes uh, to do this uh, thing, but please pay attention to the regularity and uh, how cables they are driven from the connectors to another. And so they are grouped, they are labeled. You have to respect the curvature, the bending of the cable because otherwise you can break them. And there is also some reasoning before because it's not that you, you connect the number one, the cable number one with the connector number one on the wall. So I would say that you need really to be zen when you are doing this. Uh, to me, this wall is a sort of, uh, uh, summary of uh, a particular let's say aspect uh, feature of the character of a physicist because you really need uh, but you are happy after you spend uh, a, a day cabling uh, if you push the button and uh, everything is switched on and it works i show you also some other things uh, here maybe here you see, this is very special for you because uh, visitors, they cannot go in, but we will go. And uh, thanks to Noemi, what we can see are some cables. Sometimes they are not so regularly uh, driven as before, as you see. <laughs> but however, there is, a, there is a for sure a logic here. And we have also uh, uh, optical fibers here you see and we could continue um now i don't i cannot speak here about the trigger but uh, okay maybe my colleagues can describe a little bit more say something about the trigger what is uh, how is organized the brain let's say of this uh, experiment because it's very noisy and the only other thing that i would like to add as you have seen uh, this cable is to give, but uh, maybe I will ask again before uh, going, uh, taking uh, again the elevator to come back to the surface uh, to talk about the overpressurization in front uh, of the elevator. So Andres, uh, and I give you the floor again, and uh, I say just other two words before I take the elevator, okay? Okay, so maybe I can say a quick word about the trigger. So the trigger is the way in which we filter the data. Uh, and so in this kind of experiment in CMS and also in Atlas, uh, we so collisions are produced far more often than we're able to collect them. So we really have to be uh, selective about what data we record. And so the trigger system is the way in which we decide what data to take. There are several layers. And the first layer of selection actually happens unattended and it happens also underground. And towards the end of the process, there's a much more detailed study of the intera of the interactions, let's say, of the events, we call them. And a, a finally, a decision is taken. I would, I would like uh, just to recall that uh, that picture that uh, has been shown in the previous, one of the previous talks about the amount of data and the bandwidth requirement. Uh, 
and you remember this uh, this gray patch on the top right corner that uh, <clears throat> that showed that what would the LHC LHC detectors produce without trigger that would be so much data that we don't have technology to handle and that's why we had to invent the this trigger system that basically says no 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 and in some cases yes maybe um what we know that we have uh, nine uh, we have 40 million bunch crossings per second out of that we on the first level of trigger we select something like 100,000 and uh, then uh, in the higher level trigger uh, we we select something like 1,000 per second so that's what we what we can handle and that's what we then uh, uh, analyze in uh, in our physics uh, group. And, and to give you a quick sense of um, what that means so when we select when we record one event or one interaction that roughly takes up the size of a photo so it's a couple of megabytes so mm -hmm. a single event is manageable when you when you have so many of them uh, there's of course limits to how much we can process and how much we can store Yes, Sonia. Andres? Yes, no, I wanted just to, uh, to say, as uh, following what Zoltan was uh, saying, that is as people, if we receive too many inputs, we just say no, 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 no to everybody, and we just let filtering what is more important. So the trigger is just reproducing what our brain is doing in any activity of our life. So just saying this, um, I wanted to show, uh, Andres, you were talking about the PDA. So uh, I don't know if we can see, you can tell me if we can see this gray wall that you have just in front of us, because uh, I'm on at minus, let's say 90 meters underground. And uh, we have the minus 100 that is uh, here below uh, with the, 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 um, the yellow strips. And the gray wall that you see in front of you uh, is a wall that we build each time we have to close the cavern and we remove these, there are concrete blocks of concrete and we remove and the, basically the, yes, is sliding this, uh, this wall. And uh, basically we have uh, the, the, this thickness uh, Andres was talking about. So this is another, uh, entrance, if you want, for the experimental cavern. We can also have a glimpse of the detector when it, it's open, but now, of course, it's closed because we are preparing for collisions. And then I go here before taking the elevator. In this, uh, in this uh, space that you, you saw me at the very beginning, so I show you the elevator. But this is, uh, again, uh, is a safety zone because of all this, the spaces in front of the elevator, they are safety zone in case uh, we cannot uh, evacuate because they, we must take the elevator to evacuate. We cannot take the stairs even, even if they are there. Uh, and so when you enter, okay, there are visitors entering. I just finished this. And so this zone is overpressurized. It means that basically you cannot, uh, Sorry, no problem, no problem. Uh, it, it means that basically you cannot, uh, anything can enter here. So if there is a smoke or a gas leakage outside this zone, it cannot penetrate this zone. And so we are safe. We can wait to uh, use the elevator in case it's not working. Now, what I will do, the elevator is at minus three. I will uh, call it. It should come, I hope, yes, it's coming. And I come to the surface, I give the floor to my colleagues and uh, we will see in the control room. All right, thank, thank you, you, Sonia. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so I just wanted to let you know, so the students that are here in person, their parents are gonna be wanting to, they're gonna get picked up in like five minutes. So I okay. uh, just wanted to let so, you know we're running short yes. on time. Yeah. So let's maybe jump to so questions. Jump. And there's two questions that we saw in the Q&A. So we can address them very quickly. So one is related to how long um, do are we in collisions? So, or that's what I understood from the question. So it takes us about one hour to go through the injection process if everything goes very quickly and very smoothly. So it's, let's say, on the order of an hour. And then we might have a continuous, uh, uh, let's say, 
time during collisions that could be on the order of 12 hours. That's very approximate. So sometimes it's much less, uh, sometimes it's a bit more, but I would say on the order of 12 hours. There's another question. Yeah, there was one more question that I'll answer. So it was uh, asking if the, the massive magnetic field that we have, the 3.8 Tesla, has any sort of effect on the human body. And the uh, 3.8 Tesla actually does not. However, uh, we don't allow people with uh, any active medical implants down the, into the uh, into CCMS as the magnetic effect uh, on a pacemaker, for example, could have a very bad effect on someone's health and uh, in the worst case cause death or something like something as bad as this. So we don't let anyone in uh, with any sort of metallic uh, implants. Uh, however, uh, I was speaking to a colleague before and uh, up to about once you get past around 10 Tesla, this is when uh, you could maybe see some uh, some negative effects on human health. Um, but that is an extremely high magnetic field and uh, not you're not going to find that many places on Earth. Uh, can I add something? Yes, Sonia. Yes, I wanted just to say that first, uh, I, I, I thought that the usual magnetic field for a, a magnetic resonance was two, but currently they are also using three Tesla magnet, which is comparable to almost uh, to this magnet but however we were allowed of course we are not in the center of the magnet but we were allowed sometimes and it happened to me to enter the cavern when the, mag the magnet is on which is quite strange because really uh, you don't feel uh, too much as a person but you see for example you feel all magnetized things uh, as for example my shoes uh, orientating uh, um, orienting uh, to uh, toward uh, with the, the magnetic field, or for example, my hearings uh, feeling uh, the magneti <laughs> the magnetization. So it's quite curious. But from my point of view, from my personal experience, uh, there was nothing. Of course, as it was said, I'm not uh, wearing any medical implants. These should be um, should be stressed. Otherwise, I couldn't be allowed to enter. That's it. I come to the control room. Okay, so we have to wrap up uh, very soon. So this is uh, your last chance for questions. Is there anyone who has any more questions? Please feel free. I don't see any students, uh, but I'm curious, like, where are you all from? It seems like CERN is a very international place. There's people from all um, over working together on a common goal. Yeah, oh, CERN is very diverse. Uh, me, myself, I'm from Scotland, uh, Dundee in Scotland. Um, I'm here for one year at CERN, uh, working, doing a project for CMS uh, as a mechanical engineer, working on a uh, HGCAL, which is the new energy measuring cal calorimeter um, that we will be installing um, to take more data on collisions and things like this. Um, Andres, uh, he, is, uh, he got his degree in America, I believe. Yeah, so I grew up in Puerto Rico and I did my undergraduate in Puerto Rico. I actually did mechanical engineering as an undergraduate. And then I switched to physics and I did, I did a PhD in physics. Uh, uh, Sonia, you want to say a word about your trajectory? Yes, okay. I'm a particle physicist, but for my PhD, I joined an experiment, uh, which is uh, currently on the International Space Station. And this is why I was saying that I'm an astroparticle physicist because uh, I was uh, dealing, uh, let's say, with uh, a different kind of source of particles, but the detector is a particle physics detector. And uh, okay, this is more or less my background. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's a last question, maybe we can wrap up with this, but there was a question uh, from a student asking if uh, or and how they could get involved with CMS and what kind of uh, requirements. Um, so what I would say is, the first thing is that there's a lot of diverse work that happens uh, in CMS. So, you, for example, there's a lot of engineering. Uh, it's not just physicists, right? If you're interested in physics, uh, it's, of course, um, one of the trajectories. Let's say you can study physics. And uh, I think you you should try to 
get involved with an institute or a university or a group that already does research uh, at CMS. And that's one way to get started. But again, it doesn't have to be in physics. It, there's all kinds it of engineering. It should be an academic path because we have a, a lot of uh, people, uh, for example, uh, we start with technicians. They, and, uh, you know, when we, we, when we work here, basically we do not distinguish who is an engineer, who is a physicist, who has a PhD, who is a, a, techni a, te a technician, because we just work for the same project. And so, yes, there is a responsibility on the paper. So, the, for example, the physicist and the engineer is assigning, is making the, the project if you want, but when you, you work together, we do not distinguish and so you can have a, you can be a technician with specialized technician you can be you can have your bachelor and maybe you can already be involved uh, or your master and of course if you want to go to uh, the academic path and then you can also be involved in in, um, in the meanwhile, you are doing your bachelor at the third year because we have these programs for for the students, uh, the summer students. They are called, and uh, there are also earlier stage uh, programs for high school students too uh, that can be interesting uh, to to start. They say to have a taste, and then I'm sorry, but uh, okay, physics is the place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, of, just joking. There's lots of opportunities. <laughs> If you look on the CERN website, there's lots of opportunities for like technical students uh, for all different physics, engineering, lots of different uh, pathways. So you could just go onto the CERN website and have a look at all of them, see what yeah. would maybe be best suited to you and, and work towards it. And I also encourage, especially people who are at Fermilab right now, talk to Grace, talk to the people that are there in the room with you. If you're really interested, there are plenty of opportunities. So we really encourage you to look at them. Maybe we can also say that we also need the lawyers because we have a legal office. We also uh, need the, yes, graphic designers. Drivers. Yes. Uh, oh, for example, for the press office uh, communication, now we have a, a very nice uh, um, visitor center, new visitor center. So we need people to work there. Uh, I would say uh, having uh, attended uh, many meetings uh, among physicists uh, that even uh, psychologists and uh, sociology uh, are welcome here. We are a nice, uh, how to say? Uh, Diverse. Yes. <laughs> so I think it's really a nice community, really with many countries, many uh, different domains and uh, backgrounds uh, that, okay, it's really interesting to be involved in. Okay, so I think with this, we should yeah. really wrap up. Uh, uh, you can... yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Um, I know it's well. It's Saturday morning physics for us. I know it's the evening for you. So thank you uh, for taking the time out uh, to join us. Yeah, we really appreciate it. It's really cool to get a tour of the facility. Um, yeah, anything you want to say to wrap up or just uh, thanks good to luck? you guys yeah, for joining. Thank you very much thank for you. joining and watching. Yes. It was great to give uh, the virtual visit and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Sounds good. Yeah, and we'll have Saturday morning physics. Hope we'll actually we'll be you at here. Houston, University of. Yeah, yeah. We'll be at University of Chicago next week instead of this room. So, I mean, it's hybrid. You can join on Zoom or if you can make it to Hyde Park. Um, but a lot of cool talk about neutrino physics, um, which is near and dear to Fermilab. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks very much. Joined on Zoom. Very cool. Um, yeah, and have a nice weekend. Cheers. You, you too. too. Thanks very much. Bye. See you later.